Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Bob McGoy. I'll be your host this afternoon. Just want to thank you all for attending. This is the second of 40 unique webcasts that are brought to you by Computer Aided Technology during our Design Innovation Month. This afternoon, I have a really nice presentation for you by one of my good friends out in the Albuquerque office, Dennis Barnes. He's going to walk us through assembly patterns, tips, and tricks. And hopefully, um, you'll find some really good benefit to some of the things that Dennis shows us here. Um, feel free to sign up with any of our other presentations. We've got 38 more, and the rest are going to be on YouTube here pretty shortly as they come available. Um, feel free to sign up with those at any time at www.cti.com. Um, now we've got Dennis Barnes, um, our certified SOLIDWORKS expert, to go through some assembly patterning. Thanks, Bob. I <clears throat> appreciate you guys taking the time to spend with me this afternoon. We're going to be talking about assembly patterning tips and tricks. I don't like to call them tips and tricks because I think you should make them part of your regular everyday design techniques because they're really going to save you some money. These are, um, these are all about saving time and saving money for your company. So let's just get into it, okay? First, I want to just kind of go over what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, we're going to talk about why assembly patterning is so powerful. Why would you want to use it? Why is it so powerful in your design uh, work every day? Then we're going to talk, we're going to move right into the simple patterning tools. Tools that you should be using every single day, pretty much, if you're working with assemblies. If you don't know how to use them, look at the help or get some uh, classes to use these simple patterning tools. Then we'll move right into the more advanced patterning tools. And this is where the real meat of this presentation is, and it should give you some more uh, things in your toolbox there to help you move forward with doing more advanced patterning. So let's talk right away about why assembly patterning is so powerful. Overall, it's about saving time and making more money, saving money. So what it does is it allows you to design something and reuse the design elements in, the in your assembly. So you're going to build a component and you're going to reuse that component or variations of that component inside your assembly by being able to pattern it within the assembly. Next, it's much faster to insert a bunch of parts into an assembly rather than adding them in one at a time and having to reinsert all the mates each time you add in the new component or even if it's the same component on a second instance. It also simplifies the modification of the assembly. If you need to change something about the assembly, changing it in one place with a pattern is so much faster than having to change any of the multiple instances or the mates that are involved with it. It's also going to help you with consistency in your configuration in your display state. So if you have large display, large assemblies where you have display states that you're using, some components hidden, some components suppressed, this is going to really help with consistency because you can select the entire pattern and it applies to more components than having to go through the entire feature manager tree and select specific instances. It's also a great way to get a bunch of parts into your assembly right away. It's the fastest way that I know to just get multitudes of individual components or multiples of subassemblies and so forth into your assembly very, very quickly. Okay? So let's move right on. We're going to talk about simple patterning. Okay? The first of the simple patterns that we're going to talk about is the linear pattern. Basically, this is very fast for getting large numbers of components into the assembly quickly, but there's no way to change the orientation of the component. So I'm going to show you a real quick assembly here that I created that shows the linear pattern. Get this open. And we have a linear pattern. So you see here, there's a couple of bricks. They're set offset because this is the way you would normally do a linear brick pattern or a, what do they call it, a subway pattern. So I actually added the pattern in here. So I'm just going to unsuppress it and see and show you how quickly all these components came in. So this is a rather large brick wall now. You'll see how many components I have in here. And I can change the instance count, change the distance and the spacing. Um, there's no spacing in here, so there's no room for grout, but I could adjust that very, very easily with just a couple of clicks. So that's our linear pattern. I'm going to go ahead and close that, and we'll go back to our assembly our, uh, presentation. The next thing I want to show you in a simple pattern is the circular pattern. Circular pattern, as it 
as it implies, is it's circular. So it has to follow the circular direction, either a cylinder, a circle, or around an axis or, or a line that's going to be rotating about. The orientation of all your individual components are going to follow that circular pattern. So they're going to rotate at an angle and be repeated along that pattern. So let me go ahead and open up something that I've got here that shows that. This is basically a fire pit that was created with some uh, landscaping stones. So these are those offset landscaping bricks for uh, creating uh, walls, uh, support walls and so forth. So what I did was I just created one subassembly and I created configurations inside that subassembly where the spacing of the bricks went out an inch each time for different configurations and then I mated the assembly components together and there's my fire pit. The next one that's not really a pattern, but what it do, what you do is you just bring in multiple components and it's a fast way to bring in multiple components. Uh, basically you can do a drag and drop or a copy and paste from the, the feature manager tree or wherever you copy and paste it from. Um, the thing is, is there's no mates. It doesn't copy any of the mates, so they have to be added each time. So I'm just going to do that with one of these sub-assemblies here. Basically just a drag and drop, and there it is. And it stays together. There's no problem with the mates within that, but then I would have to have it mated again down at the bottom here, or at the top. So that's copy. Pretty simple, probably the least efficient of our patterning techniques. Let's move on now to more advanced patterning tools. I get real excited about these because this is just, I just see the power in SolidWorks and I hope to gosh, uh, you guys can figure out how to do this and, uh, and, and um, we'll present this and you'll see how it works. So the mirror pattern is real simple because it just creates a copy across whatever you're mirroring. But the great thing about it in the assemblies is it allows you to do uh, manipulate the orientation of the components, any of the components that are in the mirror. And you can actually create a unique part that's linked back to the original part. We call this either left-hand or right-hand version of that part. So let me demonstrate how that works. We'll close these, and we'll go ahead and open the mirror pattern. What I have here is a tool holder, and I need to take these parts over on this side, and I need to mirror them. To the other side. So I select the components I want to mirror. I select mirror components. And then I select the plane that I want to mirror across. So that's the right plane. You'll notice there's no preview happening yet until I go to the next page of my mirror part. Here's all my components being mirrored. Now I want you guys to concentrate on this yellow part right here. The fact that it's been mirrored turns it backwards and the screw places, the places for the screws are turned the opposite directions that I need. Now I can select that component and I can adjust and select from some multiple orientations of that. But every time I adjust those orientations, it either throws off my mate or it throws off the positioning of the screw hole. I get this one additional tool here called create opposite hand version. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on that and you'll notice it flipped the part around so that the screw holes, the counterbores for the screw holes are now showing. I'm going to turn it off and then turn it back on so you can see what happened. So this stayed, but this got flipped. Okay, so it's going to create that opposite hand version. It adds it to my mirror, and then I go to the next page. The next page allows me to either create this as an internal configuration or create a brand new part with a suffix or prefix. So I'm going to create a prefix here called mirror. These are all the things that are going to be created when I bring in the part, in case I need to edit it or link back to it. Or I can break the link if I want to. Click OK. Pick the template. If you need to, change it. And there's our mirrored parts. All done. Very simple, very quick. And now we have a part there that's created inside the mirror component folder called mirror clamp. Okay. 
go ahead and close that. Let's go back to the presentation and we'll talk about a pattern-driven pattern. This is especially powerful because it allows you to take the patterns that you were using when you created your components and use them to add in more parts in your assembly that are going to follow that component pattern. So the pattern feature has to exist inside the component that's in the assembly. And the seed can be in any of the whole feature, any of the pattern feature locations. So it doesn't necessarily have to be in the original of the feature, the original feature that was patterned. It can be in any of the feature positions. So in this case, I have an assembly that I'm going to open here. Now, I'm using the toolbox to do this. I like toolbox components because they're pretty uniform, they're easy to control, and I have a whole library of them to use. If you don't have SOLIDWORKS Professional or Premium, you don't have access to the toolbox. So if you're going to use this, go ahead and make sure you have access to a toolbox. Or if you're going to use this technique, you can use it on any other components. It doesn't have to be toolbox components. Okay. So here's my component. I've brought this bolt in here onto this bracket that's around this. And I'm going to use this circular pattern of holes that I put in this bracket to create this pattern for these holes. So I go under the patterns. I select pattern driven component pattern. Select the component that I want to pattern. Select the feature that's going to create the driven. Click OK. There's all my components in there. And they filled in every single one of them. Okay. So that's the component, the pattern driven pattern. Next up, sketch driven pattern. The great thing about the sketch driven pattern is it allows you to pretty much do random positioning or regular positioning or irregular positioning of anything that you want inside the assembly based on a layout sketch. So all you have to do is create sketch points inside your layout sketch to position whatever you're going to put in there, the parts of the sub-assemblies or so forth. The unfortunate thing about this particular thing, uh, pattern is that the orientation always has to follow the seed. So there's some positioning capabilities up and down, um, but the orientation always has to be following the seed. So let's take a look at the sketch-driven pattern assembly I have here. What I've done here is I've created a layout sketch and I've brought in a subassembly for a pillar that I'm going to be using on an elevated platform for a weldment. And I want my pillars to be positioned at these certain locations, these intersection points on this sketch. So I go into the pattern drop down, I select sketch driven pattern, I select my sketch, then I select the assembly, the subassembly that I'm going to use. The reference point for this is the bounding box center. So you see they're not quite positioned correctly. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go to a selected point and I'm going to select the bottom of this pillar here or the pylon and it's going to position my components exactly where I need them at the right elevation. The great thing about this particular layout sketch is if I edit it, I can add additional components without having to modify my pattern. So all I do is I put in any of the individual po uh, sketch points that I need to drive this pattern. So I've added some center points in there. Once I get out of the sketch, watch how the pattern updates. Very quickly getting in all the components that you need using the sketch driven pattern. Continued, more advanced patterning tools. These are gonna uh, really impress you, I think. We're gonna talk about smart fasteners. Now this one actually has to have the toolbox installed on your system because it's about using fasteners. Uh, the great thing about it is that the orientation of the fasteners actually follow the driving feature that you're going to be using for inserting these smart fasteners. So let me bring up that assembly that I was using before. To use for my smart fasteners. So what I have here is I have another bracket that's around my part here where the holes are right up against each other. So I go over here and I select Smart Fasteners. It's telling me that I don't have the toolbox add-in turned on. So let me get that turned on. Now I can go back and add the Smart Fasteners. If you have a lot of them, it could take some time, but this is pretty simple, so this will go pretty fast. 
So it asks me to select the, the hole that I want to fill, and I click Add. It automatically picks a piece of hardware that was already identified when that hole was created. If you guys remember when you create your hole, wizard holes, many times it'll ask you what kind of component do you want to put in there, especially if it's a threaded hole. It'll ask you what kind of fastener you want to use. So if I don't like this fastener, all I have to do is change the fastener type. I'm going to go to a hex head bolt here. And there we go. Okay. The next thing I want to do is I want to add some components to the top stack for this. This is really handy. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and put in a regular flat washer. And it goes in right after the head above the hole. Now the bottom stack is on the other end of the hole. So I select add to bottom stack. I add in a narrow flat washer. And then maybe a lock, a spring lock. a regular spring lock washer. And last of all, maybe a hex nut. Now you'll notice as I add these components in there, the bolt keeps getting longer and longer and longer. So you can specify how long this is automatic, automatically, or you can specify it manually if you like. But the hole, the fastener automatically sizes to the hole and automatically lengthens based on the top stack and bottom stack that I create for this. So when I click OK, it did the same thing as it did for the pattern feature, but it went ahead and added all those components all the way around. Very, very fast way to insert fastener components. OK, let's move forward now. Here's another one that has the word smart in it. I like SOLIDWORKS. They use a lot of the same words over and over again in the vocabulary. So smart components are even better because what happens is you build the component ahead of time. You include all the features and components that you need in it before you even make it a smart command, before you make it a smart component, okay? So basically you have to have this dummy assembly. So I'm going to show you how this works. Go ahead and close that. I don't need to save it. We're going to open our dummy assembly so you can see what's going on here. So this is my dummy assembly. I just called it smart. I used a couple of uh, slip-on weld flanges, and I added these components using a circular pattern, mated them an appropriate distance apart so that I would have exactly the right distance when I brought those in. Once I selected the mate smart component, it asked me which component I wanted to make the smart component, and then it asked me what I wanted to add in terms of features and components. In this case, all I did was add in all of the bolts and uh, washers and nuts to make this a smart component. So, yeah, big deal. You made the assembly. You did all the mating. How do you, do, how do you use it? Well, okay, let me show you. I have a uh, routing. Routing is another great tool for building uh, nice assemblies here. And what I've done is I've created a small route. I've got a couple of flanges in here, a couple of intersections here where I have flanges. And when I built the flanges, I used two types of flanges. I used just the regular flange, slip-on weld flange, and then I used the one called smart because I created it as a different part so that I wouldn't end up with too many smart components in there. So I'm going to go ahead and open the subassembly for just the pipe route where I have my components in there. You'll notice some of my components are inside the folder for the components, and some of the components are outside my smart components here that have the little lighting bolt. The way smart components work is they have to be outside the folder. So I'm just going to drag this outside the folder. As soon as I select that smart component, it gives me a little icon on the component there with a lightning bolt. So all I do is click on the lightning bolt. It gives a picture in case I need to input anything about what's going on with that component. You see the preview for all the components that are being added. I click OK, and there's all those nuts and bolts in there in my flange. Go to a different flange. I'm going to say no. Went ahead and act, and same thing, no. There's all my components. So you see very, very quickly I can get all the nuts and bolts in here. Now, why would you want to do that? A lot of routes, you don't go ahead and put in all the components, but if you were building a route like this and you wanted to build a material that you wanted to be accurate, 
this is the best way to do it because it really gives you all of the components that you're going to be in there. Instead of having to have somebody with this huge pile of a big box of stuff and they don't know how many they're going to need or how many they're going to use out of it, this is a great way to do it because it'll create some accuracy inside the bill of materials for you. Okay, smart components. The last uh, advanced mate, uh, the advanced patterning tool I'm going to show you guys is Copy with Mates. Now, Copy with Mates is a great patterning tool, but it's not found under the patterning dropdown. It's found in a place called Insert Part. Okay, and it has this great optimized workflow so you don't have to move your mouse back and forth from the center of the screen out to the edge of the screen. So let me go ahead and open, go back to my, uh, did I still have that open? Yes. Nope, I need to close all of those and get another one in here. What I've done in this component is I've created a pattern that follows kind of a helical up the side of this part. Do you see this? See how these holes kind of go up and around? And I went ahead and stuck a screw in here just so that I can show you how this patterning copy with mates works. So we go to the insert component drop down, copy with mates, select the component we want to, and then right click. See the little button? Now, it asks me to look at the two mates that are already on the component, and do I want to copy those when I move the component? So all I do is go to the next position and select the concentric mate and the coincident mate. Right-click, and I'm back to the same place. So all I do is go up the ladder here, select the two mates, and very quickly, I can populate this. And now I'm done. See how quick that was? And they're all up and they moved along and followed the orientation because I used the same mate to create the orientation. Well, so if you want to talk to us, you can send us an uh, email at support at CAT.com or you can call the number on the screen there. We'll be happy ah, to. Uh, we've got some excellent technicians that are on the queue that will answer any questions you want. Um, they might even know my name. We we do have one um, from a gentleman r real quick for you. I think you okay. can answer this one pretty quick. Um, where do you keep the dummy assemblies for the smart components? I like to put those in an area of my design library. So I create a special folder that I point to inside my design library. And uh, it's basically I put it there and I just call it dummies or smart dummies, which is kind of an oxymoron. But um, as long as you have it there, you don't have any problems with it. Just create another folder where you can keep that. It doesn't have to be inside uh, any particular library within the SOLIDWORKS installation files. You can have it external. But as long as your system can see that, um, it will be available. So, okay, we got another one here. Do you know if any of these aspects can be utilized or controlled by DriveWorks? Um, I could probably field that one. Um, um, yeah, majority of those are just standard SOLIDWORKS features. So, I mean, every one of those is in core professional premium. So, DriveWorks is going to be able to drive those with its knowledge-based um, configuration tool. And DriveWorks loves to use those. Well, um, Dennis and I would both like to thank you very much for attending this afternoon's presentation. We were just, these presentations, all 40 of these are just going to be 25, 30 minutes long, um, just there so you guys can get some good information, get in, get out, get back to work. So um, we, we have 38 more of these coming. So if you haven't looked on the list, someone just signed you up and said, hey, go. Um, head over to CTI.com, um, the banner of our website takes you to Design Innovation Month, and you can see all 40 of the presentations and sign up for those and attend another WebEx. So, Dennis and I really appreciate you doing doing some time with us this afternoon, and we're going to fire this up again tomorrow, and we're going to do two more presentations, one at 11 a.m. and one at 1 p.m., so hopefully we'll see you then. So, thank you, everybody, and have a great afternoon.